Testing. Test. Testing. Test. Okay, I, I think it will, for the live stream, it works, but for those here in attendance, I don't. I, I can see if I have a second mic. I can oh, I think Probably. we'll be able to. Yeah. yeah. Our voices. Test. Everybody. Yeah. Worry, you guys can okay. hear pretty We're well. Loud. We're All loud. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Hi there, everybody. Thank you very much for your patience, and thank you for joining us today here at the Clark Historical Museum. My name is Josh Buck. I'm the executive director curator here. Very excited to pull off this year's Saturday Speaker Series. I'd really like to thank Susan Doniger from the Humboldt County Historical Society and Corinne with the Humboldt County Library, who may or may not be with us today. I don't think she's here. Um, but ultimately, all of these groups are working towards the preservation of local history. And it's because of folks like you that we're able to share all these stories. So thank you very much for being here today. I'm going to turn it over to Susan. Have a wonderful day. Well, thank you, Josh, and thank you all for being here. As Josh said, this is our first year of our partnership with the Clark Museum and the library in presenting this library lecture series, and we're thinking that we can really outreach to more folks through a combination of in-person and our Zoom audience, which we hope to connect to very shortly. And with that, I'd love to introduce Julie Clark. I'm sure a lot of you know she's a Bureau of Land Management Ranger, began her, began her career as a park ranger, at the Headwaters Forest Reserve uh, here. She graduated from Humboldt State in 97 with a BA in art education, minor in history, and then she received her master's in social science. Um, Julie wrote her thesis on company towns in the American West. So that's great. Julie is a real outstanding historian and presenter, and I hope that, oh, I see myself. Um, <laughs> she's written uh, her book, her, her first book on Falk, and then her latest book on lighthouse history. And I think she'll have some books for sale, and we also have them here at the Clark and at the Historical Society if you care to purchase. Um, and please, with that, give Julie a big hand, a big welcome. Thank you, Julie. All right. Well, thank you for coming today. This is absolutely one of my favorite subjects to talk about, the town of Falk. Um, so I have been working on the history of Falk since 1999, since when I started with the Bureau of Land Management. I didn't grow up here, um, but I had a similar sort of love in Southern California when I watched the orange groves and like all the orange packing buildings kind of start to sort of fade away. And so I was, as a child, I would go into these buildings and look around and and to see if there was like any evidence and sort of be the archaeology even as at 10 years old. Um, I put this quote up here by Virginia Woolf. Um, I just found out recently one of my favorite neighborhoods to go in Bloomsbury, it's in Bloomsbury, London, is where she lived and Charles Dickens lives. So it's kind of near and dear to my heart. This came out of a book from um, a different book that I was reading, but I just thought it was so poignant. Um, and such a great quote about history, because we don't always have the answers when we start, especially when I started working on the history of Falk. I wanted to know everything as possibly as I, I could when I um, sort of started my obsession, is what I would call it. And so I wanted all the answers right away, but it took a long process to find those answers. Um, so this is sort of the cover of the book that's available here at the Clark Museum, The Company Towns of the American West. It's an Images of America book. I'm sure it's for purchase. And I will sign your book as well at the end, and I'll be available after the talk. Um, I just recently also completed The Lighthouses of Humboldt County. So um, I, I believe you guys have that as well, and I can sign that as well. Um, that... This is all a, a big part of my work with BLM. So they've allowed me to research and do all this historical work um, in the office. So I'm gonna kind of break my talk into um, three different um, ways. I'm gonna talk kind of about the background in the history and how Elk River Mill and Lumber Company came to be. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Falk community and what that was like, what it was like to be a child there, a woman there, a logger, a man working in the company, and then the ghost town period between 1937 and 30, 
1979. Um, and that's how I break it actually up into that Images of America book, into chapters. I'm gonna give you a little background about the Headwaters Forest Reserve. So in March 1st, 1999, Headwaters became public land. It was a long story of how that came to be. Um, there's 2,000 acres of old growth forest in the reserve. This is a photo of the end of the Elk River Trail. So you have to hike 10 miles to see this part of the trail in the old growth. So there's one to 2,000 year old trees up there. Um, on the map, you'll see on the right um, sort of the outline of how you get there. So you would follow Elk River Road to the end. There's a parking lot, and that's how you can access the Headwaters Forest. Um, you can also go Newburg Road during the summer, and you could request a hike through our website or call, by calling our um, phone number at the BLM. A lot of people wanted to purchase the headwaters and wanted that saved. Um, there was a lot of activism that was going on for about two decades. Um, so if you're ever interested in that whole story, there's a book by um, David Harris called The Last Stand. And basically, um, most of the reserve was owned by Pacific Lumber for many years, since the 1800s, a family-owned business. Um, by the Murphy family. And in 1986, Charles Hurwitz from, um, he was a sort of a, I call him a tycoon. He called Pacific Lumber and said, I own your company. So he, he did a hostile takeover and he did that with junk bonds. And so he wanted to sort of get all his money back. So he started liquidating this, these old growth forests. And it, the environmental activists took him to court, took the company to court because they were breaking environmental laws. And um, it, it was 20 years of, of, if you were ever around in the 90s or 80s, you would um, definitely remember that time, Save Headwaters Forest. And so they, they couldn't really get the government to buy, you know, these 7,000 acres um, just by the old growth redwoods. It was the habitat that, the, that was provided for the watershed, so coho salmon, which are spawning right as we speak at Elk River. So if you haven't been out there in a little while and want to see salmon spawning, it's a really good time. It's sort of the tail end. Also for the marbled murelet, which nests in these old growth trees 300 feet high, which is a seabird. and the northern spotted owl, um, which we had five nesting pairs at Headwaters, and we only have about um, one so far. They're very quiet because of the, um, the um, barred owl, so not to be confused with the barn owl, but barred owl, which is kind of their nasty East Coast cousin is what I call it. They've come from the East Coast, and they're very aggressive, and they're they're um, fighting for territory, so a lot of the spotted owls are no longer in Headwaters Forest. They're sort of a hybrid too, so they breed with one another, but that's a whole nother story in its own. <laughs> but um, over the 24 years that I've worked with, I would say that the theme of Headwaters that is, speaks so clearly to me is renewal, regeneration, and connection. So, Right now, that, I took that photo of a spawning salmon the other day. It's laying in Elk River, has um, expended all its energy, it's spawned, and now it's time to die. Um, the salmon contributes to that forest health. All that nitrogen that it brings back from the ocean is contributing to all that forest health, all the phosphorus and nitrogen. Without the salmon, that forest wouldn't thrive as much as it does. Um, so there, there's this nice continuous um, operation going there of regeneration. Um, let me see here, I went too fast, okay. Um, there's also a timeless community that's happening out there. There used to be 50 years of operation where 200 people lived at Falk. 
And now there's a community of people out there that are hiking there, that are in, really enjoying that, that forest. Um, they're enjoying the history that's out there. They're being connected to that watershed and, and what it has to offer. Um, there's a community of, of relatives that were once connected to the people of Falk, like Lolita Webb here. Her granddaughter came out to Headwaters and she connected with me and she gave me this, um, just recently, this wonderful bracelet that I'm wearing that belonged to Lolita, that was her necklace. And so Lolita was a caretaker out there for many years, and I'll talk a little bit about her story as well. So there's always this continuous connection that never stops. That um, every time I think that Falk is kind of no longer there, I am connected again in some way, somehow. Um, there's a continuous um, appreciation of, um, that was my first tour of, of Salmon Pass there um, in 2000. Um, that was um, the man I'm, I'm hugging there is um, Riggs Johnston. Um, you might have known the Boy Scout camp is named Camp Riggs. He was the forester out at Headwaters when it was Falk for, from 1954 until the 1970s. So a lot of the trees that are planted along the trail there um, were from his work out there and working with the Boy Scouts as well. Um, and then um, we had relatives of some of the children that grew up out at Falk that Dorothy Fleckenstein and her sons before she passed would take her out there. So a lot of connections that were brought into into my work um, walking out there. So right away, I wanted to know all the answers. And um, so I looked at primary um, sources um, when I did my research on Falk. I looked at photographs and I looked at diaries and interviews. This is going too fast here. So there were a lot of artifacts um, that were recovered. There was lots of documents that were copied that were taken out of the, the um, mill and the general store in the 1970s that were brought into my office. And so I could look through all those um, primary sources and photographs. And then there's also secondary sources like Falk's Claim with John Gates, who wrote um, the book in the 1980s. He was actually able to interview a lot of people before they passed away. Um, his work is um, just, you know, priceless to me. Um, he was able to give all his uh, photographs that he had collected from other people when he was doing the work with that book. And then, um, so early on in 2000, we also had Cal Poly Humboldt come out there and they went um, in an archeology span field school. So they did an inventory of Falk and they located all the different places where the mills were, where, where the mill was, where the general store was, where the cookhouse was. And they did a complete inventory and now it's been nominated as a historic district by our archeologists. It's taken this many years. Um, but now it is um, nominated. And there's me with Jamie Roscoe when I was young and John Gates with my tape recorder. So I had that tape recorder with me everywhere I went. <laughs> um, there was an excavation of Maggie's camp. So Maggie is the woman in the center there. She was um, a fierce to be reckoned with, a force to be reckoned with. She, um, you know, ruled that cookhouse with a lot of fervor and I heard lots of stories about her. Um, she had a lot of power because she was feeding those loggers and um, she would actually not allow people that were complaining about her food to come in to her cookhouse. So she would not allow the loggers just to walk into her camp until they lined up and then she, they were ready to come in. It was very orderly. So, um, so the, Maggie's camp was three miles up from our parking lot and there was a great excavation with Cal Poly Humboldt in which they found an alarm clock and um, an iron and 
Lean Perrin's lids and dishes and lots of bones. Um, there's a whole collection actually up there um, at Cal Poly Humboldt that belonged to Maggie's camp that is still there in their records. Um, this was um, some of the areas where the china um, from that cookhouse came from and the years and they divided it into percentage and how many items. So here's some of the um, labels that were on that china that was at the cookhouse. So heavy duty china um, and, and you know, not cheap. <laughs> and definitely withstood the test of time. I also did many oral history interviews with some of the people. I, I was so lucky in 1999 that there was people in their 90s that I could interview for a few years. Um, so in 2000, I was able to interview Paul Mizuki, which is on the left, and then Wayne Miller on the right. They actually went to school together at Jones Prairie School and um, knew each other. They were both born, and Paul Mazzucchi was born in 1908. Um, Wayne Miller was born, I think, in 1906. So I was able to really get a lot of their stories. Um, they grew up near Falk. Wayne Miller grew up in Falk. His dad was the blacksmith. Um, Paul Mazzucchi lived on a ranch close by. Um, Elk River on Elk River Road near Falk and worked in Falk and many other camps as a young man, as a rigging man. So his job was to strap up those logs and he said, and run like hell because if those cables snapped, that was the most dangerous part of the woods working job because of the tension those cables would be on. Um, I'm really for just fortunate that my manager, Linda Rausch at the time would allow me to take time after working at Headwaters as a ranger and go to Paul's house and interview him. And so much so that I have 120 pages of documentation that I was able to write that book, um, Falk Company Town in the American West, because of all the people that he knew in Falk. It was like going back into a time capsule when I would talk to him. Um, he died in 2006 at the age of um, 98. And there's he and I and his wife. And so we formed quite the friendship. Um, Wayne Miller is actually in that photo as a young boy on the right, his sister Vandy on the left and then his mother in the center. So um, getting his um, stories about Falk was very interesting in that, um, especially because his dad worked in the mill, um, he had a personal um, um, attachment to that town. Um, and then he talked about Ellis Wrigley at Jones Prairie School, who's in the back there and then I believe this little boy off to the left here is Paul Mizuki when he was a child. At, it was a one-room schoolhouse, it was K through five, and it's a residence now. So if you go to Headwaters on the right, there's sort of a pond, um, it's the last house before you get to our parking lot, and that was Jones Prairie um, School, and it has a, a flagpole there still. I was also able to interview Lois Olson, whose father was the Falk bookkeeper for many years. And um, he just passed away. So he was 101 when he passed away. And there he is as a boy living out of Falk. He actually lived in the last house that um, has succumbed to the forest. So I was able to actually go into that house quite a bit. And it was across the river. So. So it was like putting all the pieces together with the photographs, the interviews, the landscape, um, and the primary sources and the secondary sources. Early on when I got to Headwaters and was looking for photographs, this was the one that came out to me. And this is from Christy Wrigley. She had a copy of it and then we were able to make a bigger copy. 
So this was like hitting the, the gold mine, especially because it is such a impressive photo for 1907. The panoramic, I mean, this was one negative and um, you'll see the mill at the center. The landscape of a company town is usually very similar and in all other areas where company towns were built, even in our area. So you always had the mill center and then you had the superintendent's house over in the back usually or very close to where the operations were happening so that they could see and overlook what was going on. Like if you were to go to um, Carson Mansion and stand there and look at the Carson Mansion, just below that mansion was where the Carson Mill was right along the water. Um, so when I did my studies of mining, milling, all of the different company towns, it was always sort of a similar setup and where the superintendent was looking right over the mill. Who's the photographer today? Do you know? No, I don't know. I don't think any thing either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think it was someone from our area, though. Oh. Um, this uh, photograph came on, it was the same um, day, the same photographer, 1907, very long panoramic, and I found this um, out of the Peter Palmquist collection, which is, um, he gave all his collection to Yale University, but it's online through Humboldt State. When I was doing the Falk book, I came across this one, and it almost brought tears to my eyes, because here it was almost 20 years later from when I first got the original panoramic photo. And now I've got this other view where the photographer is. And I know exactly where that is because there's 1907 and 2020. So there is the same stump and yeah. Cool. <laughs> I was able to compare that bend in the road Yep. No forest there. Yeah, exactly. So the forest um, really obscures everything. So when you find, I can see something recognizable like the bend in the road and then the same stump I went out there and then compared. And I was like, okay. This is leading up to Lolita Webb's house. Um, which if you've ever been out to Headwaters um, is completely forested. Um, that picture on the right almost looks like you were driving down Elk River Road. And it's just unrecognizable now. It's all grown back into a forest. Regeneration. So I'm gonna get a little bit into the details of Elk River and Noah Falk. So Noah Falk left Ohio in 1854. He was 17 years old. He didn't have a lot of money. He was coming out for the gold rush, San Francisco. And by the time he got to San Francisco, he actually took the short route. He went through the Chagres River area before the Panama Canal, walked 13 miles to get on a schooner and then up to San Francisco. So he avoided going around the Horn. Um, he got up to San Francisco and he realized in 1854, there's no money anymore left in the gold rush. It was, it was hyped up. By that time, a lot of the gold was kind of gone. I mean, a lot of the peop people that were making money were the merchants in San Francisco, selling all the supplies to the gold miners. So he came up to Mendocino and he worked quite a bit of time there um, in a sawmill that, um, in Albion that was um, one of the first sawmills actually to mill redwood. And then by the time he, um, in this photo, um, he's much older, but um, by the time he was approached in 1884, he was 47 years old. He had three mills in Arcata. He was partners with Isaac Miner at the time. 
And he and eventually ended up being the president of Eureka Bank, which where we're standing. He was the president here. Um, he was president of Arcata Hotel. He was very influential in Arcata. And so he was um, regarded as a, a good person to be an investor and work with investors from San Francisco. So they purchased 9,000 acres out of Elk River. And by that time too, a little bit later, he, um, that mansion that you saw actually is where Wildberries is today. Mm -hmm. Yep, wild berries. Yep, right on the. T <laughs> you probably remember. I don't remember. I just know it's sad that it's not. Yeah, they tore it down to build a Safeway. Friend of mine, friend, when he was a young boy, he used to go to the cellar, bring coal to his wife. They put coal on the. Yeah, coal. Uh huh. Yeah, <laughs> so you have a personal connection. I think he's actually standing in front of the bank there, the Eureka Bank. Yeah, he's standing in front of Tim Stanley Oh, is he? Okay. <laughs> oh, you're right. I never noticed that. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so this was his view of standing up on top of the mansion. I don't know if he, the photographer's there or if he's there, but that's the view in 1903 from his house. Mm -hmm. And that's like if you were at Wildberries looking out towards the bottoms, um, that would be your view of Arcata. So he and my Isaac Miner had the Dolly Varden Mill, which is where the Jolly Giant um, Commons is, the dorm. So they had, um, they were partners there. And um, there was a big story at the Miner Theater. They don't really show it anymore, but I always thought that was really interesting. So they were sort of in competition, him and Isaac Miner. And Isaac Miner was like, how am I going to keep my name going? And and Arcata, and they said, open a movie theater. And so, <laughs> and so, sure enough, you know, everybody knows the minor theaters, and it's still going. <laughs> so in 1884, they built the Elk River Mill and Lumber Company. And by then, too, you had to have a railroad. So there was the Bucksport and Elk River um, Railroad Company, and um, Noah Falk was actually um, kind of running that and investors and he sold his share to Carson um, so he didn't want to run the mill and the railroad so in order to get the logs out the railroad had to be in place and had to take out his milled wood to Bucksport which is where the Bayshore Mall is unfortunately six years there's the rail line and then Bucksport would be all these schooners out there um, transporting all the milled wood all over the world to Japan, um, San Francisco. Oops, this is a really touchy computer. So that was the logging truck of the day. And then six years after they built the mill, there was a fire, and then Noah lost 120,000 um, board feet off that. Um, there was a fire because if you see that man with the wheelbarrow right there, that's all sawdust coming out of the mill. If It's highly flammable. So there's a little spark and boom, that whole thing goes. And that's exactly why the mill burned. Um, and of course, you know, they probably didn't have a fire department out there. Um, but they realized early on, we really need to get a handle on this, and they made sure that that didn't happen again, and it didn't, that was it. So they rebuilt the mill. And by 1907, after the 1906 earthquake devastated San Francisco, much of the milled wood that came out of Humboldt County and Falk, um, 40,000 board feet per day was coming out of Falk. Uh, so Noah actually was, doing quite well in business. 
another view of the mill there with that same day, that 1907 day. Um, Noah Falk really took advantage of the technology that was going on. So there was a big transition from the circular saw to the band saw. So one of the first band saws ever to be used in the country was actually at the Falk mill. So he didn't, it didn't matter what size of log was going through the mill um, because now you had a bandsaw that was up and down instead of these big circular ones that you had to keep making big circular, bigger and bigger and bigger. And once the bandsaw was invented, it didn't matter anymore. So that's inside the, it was all on steam too. So um, early on they used oxen to transport the logs to the railroad and he took advantage of the Dolver steam donkey, which you can see at Fort Humboldt today. And those are all brought into the woods with skids and then bringing that, those logged, um, those huge giant redwood logs to the, um, to the railroad. And you can see that the bigger job, I think, is the, the, the water jacks, they call them. So you can see the, the mules there with the men um, and the water pails um, transporting the water to get to those <laughs> steam donkeys in the middle of the woods. I mean, that was a big feat. And then getting those around. Um, what I found really interesting too, um, probably the most fascinating to me in the study of Falk and even the lighthouse community, I always like the community and the people and what they were doing and the stories behind um, their lives. Um, so many of the people that moved out there, um, you know, you're, working for a company, you're owned by the company. Has anyone heard that story? Um, I owe my soul to the company store. Yeah. So from 1880s to 1930s, it was all over the United States. These were isolated areas. Falk was incredibly isolated. They might as well have been in Ukiah, really. I mean, it was three to four hours to get into Old Town Eureka from Falk. You had to walk or you had to ride your horse. I mean, they were in the middle of nowhere. They were really dependent on the company that they worked for. They were dependent on the store there, the wages that they were making, um, whether they were exploited um, or taken care of. It could, it could have happened either way. So um, the living conditions in a lot of our area was actually pretty good, especially Falk was um, known to treat their workers really good. Um, Cornell also was an area that was, um, they were also treated very well as well. Um, my a friend Paul Mizuki, um, he said that um, ham and lumber really treated him well. He remembers working in the woods all day. He would come back to this little bachelor cabin with a wood stove and he'd have clean sheets and the wood stove already burning so that when he was all wet from being in the woods all day, or it was a wet day. Um, the cabin was warm and he had nice clean sheets to sleep in. Did they have a medical doctor, I mean a doctor, a company doctor or a company hospital out there? No, not at Falk. So I'm sure they might have had a, some medic or something like that, but if you were hurt or anything like that, you were just taken out by train. So they did use the train for certain things that you needed to get to town pretty quickly. So. There was some pretty serious accidents. Um, the children growing up in company town um, had quite the life too. And um, that was where I was more familiar when I was studying because many of the people I interviewed were children growing up in the company town. They re relied on their family to thrive, children. Um, and they maybe had one or two toys that they kept, you know, that was um, really important to them, like a doll for a girl, um, for a boy it might be, especially when he gets older, like a, a gun that they could go shooting on the weekends with their friends or a fishing pole, um, very important to them. So it was like less is more. Um, Dorothy Fleckenstein, I showed her picture where her sons took her out. She was born in Falk in 1918. Her mom died of Spanish influenza, um, so the Spanish flu, um, she, at six months old. So she was raised by her aunt, <clears throat> Helen Fleming, and there's her brother, Ernie. 
she um, told me a story when she was in her 90s that um, she had had a dollhouse made out of, um, from a stump. Um, and she, that's how she entertained herself as a child. She didn't have a lot of friends. It was a really difficult life. I remember she said it wasn't the best life for her. She said she would never eat salmon. She would never eat deer again. She left when she was 18 years old. She became a hairdresser in San Francisco and she never wanted to come back. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> um, years later, after I interviewed her, um, one of our docents was off trail and he found on the right a doll head. And I said, hey, where did you get that? And he said, I found it in a stump. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh my gosh, that might be Dorothy Fleckenstein's doll. So I did a little research and um, it's a German doll from the 1800s. Um, so just being in one place is really helpful, especially when you have all these stories and then you can match the artifacts with it and it comes full circle. It's like one of the most powerful um, things that happen, like this big full circle. <laughs> the co continuity. Um, this is Shirley <laughs> Callahan. <laughs> so the boys had quite the life. So they would go fishing and hunting on the weekends and it wasn't ladylike for the girls. So to be playing outside, but um, there was a fish story written by um, Bessie McGowan's stepdaughter, and she talked about Elk River being a pretty stream and full of trout, um, which are spawning now, um, the salmon, um, and just how her dad would tie his own flies and um, handmade uh, fishing poles. So life was very different out there. It was sort of like that less is more, I would say. Very simple. The women in, in fall had a, you know, they were in different roles. So there were, they were either a waitress in the cookhouse, they were working in the cookhouse, they weren't in the woods, obviously, or they were uh, like Maggie, the cook. Um, so often the waitresses would meet the loggers and marry them, I found in my studies, and have a family and then they wouldn't be working there anymore. They would be taking care of their children. Um, and they were sort of like the backbone of the family, keeping it all together. Um, there was stories when I was researching about um, accidents that would happen where her, the husband died. And of course, there wasn't what we have now, life insurance, workman's comp, um, where if your husband died and he was the sole maker of money, then you had to figure something else out. And in my studies, I did find that um, looking into the research that maybe her oldest son would go at 14 years old and go work in the mill to keep the family going. So it was very hard in many ways. So this photo on the right, you can't see it, but it says, in the land of sawdust. <laughs> And that was, um, like I said, there was a lot of sawdust. They're staining in sawdust. The, the whole area of Falk was all sawdust away from the mill. <laughs> it was just everywhere. I can't imagine what, they were probably breathing it all the time. Um, there was a lot of camaraderie among the women. So as you can see in that photo, they're knitting together. Um, they would teach each other how to dance. They would talk about maybe the boy that they saw at the dance hall. Falk had a dance hall. Um, on Saturday nights, they would go and dance until 5 a.m., um, cooking pies and bringing a potluck dinner to dance where they would stop at midnight and have this huge potluck and then dance again. Um, you know, they were well-dressed, too. Every, every photo I see of these women, I mean, you know, for a lumber town where it's like in the land of sawdust, they, they're dressed pretty well. <laughs> and then on Sundays after this dance hall, they would have these great big picnics where they would all get together and share their meals. And they would also share um, a lot of ornamental uh, trees like 
plum trees and things that would make good jam, like marmalade jam. And some of those trees are still out at Falk, and one of them produces near the parking lot these big, beautiful yellow plums. Um, so the buildings may not be there anymore, but some of the fruit trees and the things that they planted are still there. And of course, the men in Falk were either busy on the railroad, they're working in the mill, or they were logging. In 1921, a lead Sawyer made $60 a month. So if you did inflation, that would actually be a pretty good wage. But what I thought was really interesting, room and board, especially if you were in just a bachelor cabin, was $5 a month. So, I mean, that's $55 you can pocket. That's not the case today. That's not the ratio. <laughs> so, most of your money goes to rent and board and food nowadays. So, they made about 25 cents an hour. They worked 10 hour days. And does anyone know how long it would take to, to cut one of these by hand? <laughs> or several days. Um, this is what a typical bachelor cabin would have looked like. Just a, a desk and a bed and a chair. Very simple. <laughs> the bachelors at Falk doing their own laundry with uh, washboards, probably on Sunday, hanging their laundry. And then in the 1930s, and this happened all over with company towns, there was a decline. Um, no longer did people have to be in a company town. It wasn't isolating anymore. They could drive their cars. Especially like once the automobile was pretty much um, ubiquitous all over in, in the area, they didn't have to stay in the company-run housing anymore. They could commute to, from Eureka. So the idea of a company town sort of kind of went away. In 1937, well, I would say 1930, um, Falk closed its doors. And the reason why they closed their doors, they were still running on steam. So they were working on all this ingenuity early on with the technology. But by 1930, they still had an upgrade to electricity. And the mill needed upgrades and they were running on steam donkeys and so they applied for a million dollar loan which is about 230 million dollars today and they got new tractors and everything and they got the mill running again for one year and then it wasn't enough to pay the workers coupled that with the depression at the time and so they shut the doors in 1937 for good so all the buildings um, became abandoned and the mill shut down and everyone left, except for a few people. And Garibaldi was one of the last Falk residents. They called him Garibaldi because Italian for general. Um, but he had worked in the woods as a young man, or I think in his 40s, actually. He was a Sawyer at 40, 47, as I saw in the census. And he lived in this shed and um, the story was that he had saved all his money in a Swiss bank account or a bank in Italy. And after the war, after World War II, um, something happened to that. And then it completely took all of his savings. So he had nowhere to go. And Falk allowed, um, or the, the company that owned um, the area of Falk, um, the lumber company let him stay on in one of the buildings in this cabin. So he was the last official resident um, of that near the mill uh, in 1961. And there is his, if you want to see like where it was in relation to the mill, it's like way back in the back there. So a lot of people may have remembered in this room going out to Falk in the 1950s and 60s looking for bottles, maybe not um, as a child or just knowing that it was out there. Um, it was very intriguing to people to go into these old buildings and look around. It would have been for me. 
Um, but it was private property and the company didn't want people going into these buildings because it was a liability. Um, people were going into the mill or into two story homes and falling through the second story. Um, there was just too much of a liability of people getting hurt. Um, and what they would see when they went into the mill is it was like time stood still, especially with the, the early, early on, like in the 1940s, there was still books in the bookshelves. There was a piano in one of the houses. It was like really, truly a ghost town. People would get sort of a, they said the hair would raise on the back of their necks. You know, it was just kind of an eerie feeling. Um, the band saws were left in the mill. A lot of the tools was there. Um, when we did a culvert recently, we pulled up a lot of those band saws that were still there. A lot of fog is still under the surface, really, um, but it's for, and protected by the Antiquities Act. So it's very, um, it's a felony that if you went digging, but we did find those. Um, this is what the building started to look like in 1970s. So, um, the, you know, the course of the windows are broken out. And um, Charlie Webb and Lolita Webb were there from 1950s and 60s, tr keeping people out of this ghost town. Um, and they were hired to do that. And uh, recently I talked to Eric Hollenbach um, of Blue Ox Mill. And I was, and I said, did you ever go out to Fog? And he said, yeah, I was, when I was a kid, I, um, when I was in high school, I, we would take this road and we'd go way, 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 way. And I kind of know which road he's talking about. I would go way, way, way. And he goes, and he'd always find us. <laughs> Charlie would always find you. He's like, he had eyes in the back of his head. <laughs> so everybody knew about him. He had a shotgun full of rock salt. <laughs> Um, Riggs, who I'm, I'm hugging there, he was there from 1954 to the 1970s, and he was heartbroken, he said, because, you know, he just saw the town, ghost town, sort of be dwindled by looters and people going out there and grabbing things and taking it. And so he was very protective of that, and it was heartbreaking for him to see that. And he really expressed that to me. But now there's new caretakers. <laughs> Do they have a cemetery there? No. Uh -uh. Most of the people were either buried at Myrtle Grove, so a lot of people of Falk were buried there, or um, um, Ocean, the Ocean Cemetery, um, Sunset Ocean. Does anyone know that by the Bayshore Mall there? Ocean View, that's right. So what's left of Falk now that all those buildings and things are gone? Um, we did have a craftsman-style house where Vernon Olson, the bookkeeper, was, and um, Lewis Olson, who I interviewed. Um, and that was standing for several years. That, that photo was taken me, by me. Um, I actually could walk in that house. Um, but in 2013, a tree fell through it, and that's what you see out there now. It's on the other side of... The trail so there we actually have a new trail that's sort of near there um, at headwaters it's only open seasonally um, from mm, june to november but that was the last house that was there um, it was really interesting to find that house and because i we were just standing there in 2000 looking across the river and somebody goes there's a house over there and i was like i'll go check it out um, there was a Model T dump truck that would take all that sawdust I talked about away. Um, and then over the years, the building that it was under collapsed on it. And now that is still out there. You can still see the chassis that's over by the town of Falk where it used to be. And then we have the historic train barn that we moved in 2008. Um, that is now the education center out there. So we do have events and things like that in the summer. It's very cold in there right now. There doesn't get a lot of sunlight, um, so it's not very inhabitable. But in the summer, Friends of Headwaters will open the barn on Sundays from 12 to 3, so you can actually go in there and look around and talk to the docents and look at photos of folk. 
So this is the movement that happened in 2008 where we took boards um, off of it and labeled it and the Forest Service had a team that actually put it back together again. And even, I would say, even myself is becoming history out there. <laughs> this is me walking with kids and the forest is completely, you know, I, I remember when it was just barely above my head, Hank. <laughs> um, that, this is one of my first field trips out there. So now it's this new community of people that are, this is our forestry um, college of the Redwoods class that was just out there. And so now that dead salmon in the river that I opened up this slideshow is making much sense to me because I see this whole circular um, connection and endless timeless sense of headwaters out there that's all connected to the watershed, to the people that were once there, and now this new community that's visiting out there today. So now it's a new era of people and community that can appreciate it. Um, there we are on the bottom doing Halloween at Headwaters, um, which was an event where we play the folk actors and we come out and tell you the story. Um, and we have people that can bike out there for the first three miles and, and, and enjoy the area in a different way. Thomas Dunklin took this photo not too long ago because when we were out at Falk originally, we could see that whole ridge line of Falk, but now it has completely grown, on, grown in. So I asked Thomas Dunklin, he was doing a drone video footage. I said, can you go up a little higher and show me that ridge line? And so he took a picture of it and that is what is out there now. So you can see really good when, you're, when they're just right next to each other, that ridge line and what it is today. And there we have a recent picture by Dean Thomas of the spawning salmon out there. Um, my photo credits and thank you to the Clark Museum and the Humboldt County Historical Society where I got a lot of the photos as well the Humboldt Room, the Eureka Library, of course, and the Humboldt State University. The Callahan family gave me a lot of those photos. John Humboldt Gates, the Bureau of Land Management, Paul Mizuki, and Wayne Miller. And that's it. Wow. <laughs> Is there any questions? Yeah, so there's a place where we have steps going down to the river near Falk, and we were making them not too long ago, and it, we were trying to get footholds in those steps, and it was all sawdust. So yeah, if you just go off the trail. It's still out there. Yep. Out there. I was a forester there. Yeah, I Hank is. 1999. And yeah, <laughs> we tried to replace some culverts, and we found out we just dig enough sawdust. Yeah, Hank and I worked together many years, so it's nice to have him here. I don't know. I mean, redwood, it seems like that would be pretty rough on your lungs, the redwood sawdust, because of the tannic uh, tannins in it. I don't know. I mean, it it seems like it would be pretty acidic, but any any type of you know, airborne particles like that is probably going to really affect your lungs, I would imagine. And I know that they probably didn't wear masks, you know, <laughs> especially in the mill. So. Yeah, I know um, not particularly in Falk. I didn't see any Wiat or, you know, any Yurok names, but I know there was a lot of um, like Finnish, Swedish, Norwegian. Um, there was a lot of Italians like Paul Mizuki. Um, 
Yeah, as far as that goes. But definitely like continuous today, that is an important part of the we at Terry. I would say that, yeah, there was, I, there's also a lot of evidence of archeological. There was something that was done in Headwaters um, uh, survey where they found mortar and pestle on the ridge line. Um, so there's definite presence there, but no, I don't think there was in the logging town itself. But yes, very important to Headwaters. When there was, there was a Meg, one time, over when in her kitchen, she grabbed a meat cleaver, <laughs> and she was the, she chased him out with a meat cleaver. Yep. So there's a story, if you ever read in the Falk book, of Maggie, she was working on a Sunday making pies or, you know, getting ready. And this man walked in that she didn't know. And he was an investor from San Francisco and he happened to walk in on her. And she was getting um, a pot of, you know, food going for the dinner. And, she, you know, she didn't recognize him. So she grabbed a meat cleaver and she ran after him and she chased after him. She's like, no one met, oh, the reason why she did that wasn't because he walked in. He was smelling what was in her pot <laughs> that she was making. So he kind of helped himself, and she did not like that. Like I said, you couldn't just walk in as a logger. She would also bribe the kids with cookies and candy. Paul would tell me this story. And she would um, say, go find out who's complaining about my food. Oh, my. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so she was definitely, she went through three husbands, and someone said, well, she must have been a bear to live with. I said, I, you know, I don't think she had much tolerance um, <laughs> for people that treated her poorly. So um, every now and then I will go up to her. She was born in November, November 4th, I want to say 5th. Yeah, November 5th is her birthday. And um, so I will go up to the Ocean Cemetery, Ocean View Cemetery, and I know exactly where her grave is. Unfortunately, her son is buried next to her. He died when he was 14. Mm -hmm. So he was in the photograph with her. He was the little boy. Um, he had a hunting accident. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep, the Falk number one. That's a good point. So the Falk number one is the gypsy. It's it was like kind of the workhorse of the. It would get all those logs out. It's just, it's it's at Fort Humboldt. Oh, good. Oh, good. All right. John was talking, and somebody pulled a whistle on a donkey. And John said, I feel like somebody right now. Wow. That's a story. You know, I know about this because I belong to that world. Yeah, he. He's a Falk fan, <laughs> Tony. <laughs> so glad to meet him. <laughs> That's pretty I just fascinating. Say, I really appreciate this, and I'm glad that I'm old enough to remember the, the Redwood sidewalks. Oh. Yeah, because actually in that picture where so no folks. Was made by, was Redwood too. Yeah. In Arcata, in that photo where that he had that view, did you see the mm -hmm. the redwood? Yeah, so you remember that. I remember the sound. My stroller. Was oh like, wow! <laughs> was that an Arcata or? Oh wow! Oh wow! That's great. And apparently there was a big um, there was redwood sidewalks here in Old Town, and Paul would tell me that it was full of holes from the the corks from the logger boots <laughs> when they were going up and down. Second Street. What are the challenges that BLM has now in managing that land with all that sawdust and the new growth? And it, it has to have changed the topology in the county somehow. Do you have challenges in managing? 
Yeah. Um, so the forester out there, David. I, I can speak a little bit. Yeah. Was yeah. Getting what? Uh, there's a definite plan. Uh, yeah. But the problem was that uh, it was overstocked. It was planted. Uh huh. A lot of we planted stumps out. It was overstocked. And at first, nobody wanted to do anything. Just let it be. And we had a lot of meetings in San Francisco with environmental organization, and uh, they said, "Ah, oh, leave it alone. It's natural." And we try to convince them it's not natural. There's 2,000 acres are natural. The rest was locked over, severely harvested, replanted, and uh, it was fully stocked. But it was like we had some places over 500 or 600 trees per acre, mm -hmm. and we try to convince them that we had to do some thinning commercial thing, not logging. We had to thin them out like thinning out the carrots in the garden. And I remember we had them out there on field trips, so finally I said, come here, come with me. Let's call through this. And I made him call through these stands on the hands and knees. <laughs> and they kind of go, yeah, that's not natural. So we got the plan going. It went through public review several times in San Francisco. And they kind of came on board that we could do some thinning. Yep. So we thinned it out. And the growth is so rapid. Yeah. It's unbelievable how fast the trees grow. If you thin it out, so they've been, they've been, uh, and they've been on top of that decommissioning the roads. They spent millions of dollars decommissioning yep. the roads. So we've I removed, a little bit about that. yeah, so we've removed 30 miles of road in headwaters yeah. that were logging roads. Because it's just about go to road to everyone you speak to. Yeah. The skid trail. So we're like <laughs> three, five thousand miles of skid roads in that little area. We spent a lot of money. Every one of your big trees with the tractors and oxen. And, and yeah, and in the resource management plan, the primary goal to manage headwaters is to have that second growth one day look like that old growth. To have those old growth characteristics. Mm -hmm. And that's our mission in management. Yeah. And, and so, removed, yeah. The, the roads were removed because of the erosion hazard it was just tremendous for the salmon and really did. Yeah. So what they did is they took the to big, the culverts, so they did they have what they called humble crossing where they just took some big trees, laid them across the drainage and then put dirt over them. Yep. Okay? And we dug some out that were probably 50, 60 feet deep drainages and reconstructed the drainages. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah I, I was, uh, uh, I, can, I got the history, a little bit the logging history, and I got a little bit uh, <laughs> personal excitement about it because uh, when I went to the Timber Wars as a forester, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> I was a bad person. I was a real bad person because <laughs> I destroyed the forest, which not. My degree was in forest ecology, and my job was Force management. Anyway, I went through the 80s, the, the struggle with the timber. So my supervisor, we came up with a plan. I didn't call myself force anymore. I went to public meetings and called myself a force ecologist. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I was a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Part anywhere as a forester, but I remember when the struggle was who was going to get the land. The Forest Service couldn't get it. Yeah, he it knows. Was not in the political yeah. boundary of a natural where they could not acquire it, and nobody wanted the Forest Service to have it because they didn't trust the Forest Service. The national park it was not allowed to become a park for the public because of different criteria. So our. Uh, Director of the BLM, state director, said, we take it because it fits our plan. And at that time, our field manager, Ms. Um, Linda Rausch. Linda Rausch, she was very active. The committee trusted her. And I had no idea. She comes up to me one day. She says, Hank, we need photos, aerial photos of the area tomorrow. I said, how did I get aerial photos? So I called a photographic 
at that time we had Aerosportage. We didn't have uh, uh, Google Earth yet. So I called a company named Eugene, and within 24 hours I had detailed photos of Edwards, oh. Aeros photos. And we started putting them in the mosaic together, and, <laughs> and then uh, I spent many times with, uh, we spent some time with uh, uh, Senator Feinstein. She was instrumental in pushing it through. It was an exciting time, but it was like, uh, yeah, I, so I was. Yeah, that was, so it was acquired March 1st. I came in May, but he was in May 1999. But you were there like when it was, it was fast. It happened fast, didn't it, for well, the BLM? The negotiation took place till midnight. They had a, a, a certain time, they had to finish negotiation, and it got settled up about 24 minutes, 20 minutes before midnight. Senator Feinstein managed yeah. to get her words to get on board and get it sold. So it sounds like with the county being just in the historic, historical aspect, a lot of this wouldn't have happened because of the, the partnership of interest in uh, you know, reclaiming the forest and preserving the history. Uh, I think the, 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 the backtrack a little bit of what it was is that the, those people that know of her words, he was a corporator. He did not recognize that if he took a company over that was, for example, uh, made underwear or dishes, nobody would care if he raided the company. But he raided a company that had natural resources that people were attached to. Yeah. And when he liquidated the resources, people saw the evidence and go, this can't keep going. Yeah. And they immediately tried to stop it. And he kept saying, I'm going to log it. He started building a road right to the middle of it. And uh, the environmental community got active and, yep. and put a stop to it. It was environmental pressure that, that plus the fact that what he was going to do with that stuff. And it was interesting. I don't know. If some of you want to leave, it's fine. But it was interesting because when I first started, um, we're researching on Falk as the ranger. I think at first they were like, wait a second, um, aren't you supposed to be into the old growth? And I am, but I'm also really interested in the history. So I think the timber community at that time felt sort of disenfranchised by the whole headwaters. So here I was like, hey, can I have Falk tours? And Linda was really on board with that because you know, we work for the government. We want to reach everyone, not just the environmentalists and the sign. You know, the people that are just into old growth. So this was a really inclusive study to talk about Falk, and so it was a it was a good match for me and and my career, and also for the BLM to really like make it all this whole inclusiveness instead of just like oh there was a town there, you know they're all bad, you know. Well, you saw, you saw the picture of what it looked like, what it looks, what was it, 2019? Yeah, 2020, yeah. Uh, the growth rate is so fast there that I think in about another 50, 60 years, You're cold. years you start seeing the commercials. You say about 100, 110 years, you will start seeing the, yeah, it's, it's. I hope I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> In some I spirit. Forced, uh, I'm well, trained to look at uh, what it looked like in the past. Uh, yeah. As a forest, I'm trained as a forest ecologist. I need to know what it was used to be and what it's going to be in the future. Yeah. Versus uh, uh, a lot of people just take a picture and they, they think that it's constant. It's changing. Yeah, it's changing all the rapidly. time. Yeah. So I'm happy about it. It's going to, yeah. you know, it's great. Well, we put a lot of effort into it between thinning and decommissioning roads to yeah. get it on the way. Yep. It's now running itself, so it's Were awesome. There any efforts at all when it was still the mill and everything of any replanting? Well, it was planted. Oh, they planted it heavily. In the okay. 50s, 60s, they planted. Oh, they, they planted. In fact, it was overstocked. It had too many trees for acres. Okay, so it was the lumber company that did that. I was mistaken. I was mistaken. No, uh -uh. we did some. We did some planting on all the decommissioned roads. We yeah. Planted. The decommissioned roads we went to plant. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for everyone for coming and you. yeah. Amazing story. <laughs> Good. Thank you, folks, for coming out. Thank you, Julie. Wonderful presentation. Yeah. I think a couple of you may have gotten charged.